What a mess. What an absolute mess. I mean, each time you say, oh, this is different than it was. What's it gonna be like in October? What's it gonna be like next April? There isn't a lot about the Colorado River that Jack Schmidt doesn't know. He's been making research trips on it for decades. But he's never seen the river this low. Look at this. Yeah, you used to be able to back a truck in here right into the water. Is this new this year, essentially? Yeah, it's happened within the past six months. I am stunned by how horrible this is. The Colorado is the lifeline of the American Southwest. It runs nearly 1,500 miles, supplying water and electricity to seven states in Mexico. Some 40 million people rely on its resources. But 20 years of drought made worse by climate change have brought things to a moment of crisis. This part of the river was once the upper end of Lake Powell, one of the two main reservoirs. Lake Powell filled for the first time in 1980. That concrete ramp was filled with houseboats, people backing in motorboats, people water skiing. And now look at that. Essentially 1999, 2000 was the last time the water was up at the base of that concrete ramp. And now it's lower than it's ever been since it filled. It's not only Powell. Lake Mead, the river's other major reservoir, above the Hoover Dam, is only about a third full. Unless things change, which they won't, this month officials will declare a Tier 1 shortage for the first time ever. That means next year, major cutbacks are coming, starting with Arizona farmers. When that happens, a lot of farms will look like Nancy Kaywood's. She relies on water from another river, a tributary to the Colorado. But it got so low, she was totally cut off in April. So this out here, just looking at this, I mean, is this... Take is a look. This, is this dead now? Well, we don't think it's going to green back up. What were you growing here? Alfalfa. Uh-huh. See the seed lines? Uh-huh. And how it's just all dead. Our dam has no water. We have no water, period. So this is my granddad, and he bought the farm in about 1930, and here he's in the 40s, and he's listing a field, getting ready to plant cotton. It's <laughs> <laughs> an amazing photo. It's about the only picture I have of him on the farm. And this is our family. Um, this was out in a cotton field. It's really hot, everybody's squinting. It was in August. What I'm struck by looking at this picture, you said it's August, but you're standing in a bright green field. Beautiful green, and it's right over where that dead right. alfalfa is. Isn't that gorgeous? And that was taken in 2019. I feel like we've been talking about this moment as a future thing for a long time. This idea that there's going to be a time when we have to reduce water usage. We have to we have to pay attention to that. But being out here, it feels like that moment's here already. It's here. Here we are. And there's no turning back. No. Right now, the population is not going to feel affected. Farmers are going to feel it. Does that create a little bit of a divide where farmers yeah. are in this place where you're well, it you're doesn't taking seem the fair to me? Yeah. You know. Uh, yeah, I think it does. There's a big push for land development here, encouraging industry to come in here, you know, new businesses, which means more homes. And as that happens, they're going to be using water just like we are. The decisions over who loses water first were largely made back in 2019 as part of a drought contingency agreement between the states that use the river. It took six years to work out and was set to expire in seven. That means negotiators are already starting to worry about how they'll do it all again with many states still trying to build new pipelines and developments, and even less water to go around. Tom Bushatsky is responsible for making Arizona's case and navigating all of these tensions. Starting with the job contingency plan discussions in 2018 and 2019, we have been talking about climate change and the hotter and drier future, really putting that point out there to the water users that we have to be prepared for that. And I think a lot of what's going on with the Colorado River is the hotter, drier future is already here, and it might get a little bit worse. Is so, it fair that farmers who ostensibly are doing something that's sort of essential, growing food for us to live, that they're having to cut back when other people are watering their lawns and not having to limit their shower length? That is a debate that has been growing. 
But the way the legal priority system works for water supplies, the farmers have that lower priority than the cities. Do you think as this gets harder over the coming years that the interstate negotiations are going to get trickier? So the harder it is in your state, the harder it will be between the states. So the answer is clearly yes to that question. It remains to be seen what will happen. I know that we collectively will negotiate something. We will. What it's going to be, I don't know. When it's going to be, I don't know, but failure is not an option. It is because otherwise Mother Nature is going to take over. There are no easy answers for this, are there? There are not. And in water, there never are. Do you think we're at a critical point? I think we're at a point where the old ways will not suit us going forward. So we are at a political critical point where we need to really have hard-nosed talks about where is the best place to use water to do the best good for human society. We have lived with the imagination that there is more water to develop, and so we can increase development, and it won't hurt anybody. But it is a zero-sum game. There's not any more extra water to develop. dam was the first major dam of its kind that was built and at the time it was built it was the largest in the world. It impounded Lake Mead and downstream agriculture was the primary reason that it was built. We just recently passed a historic low in Lake Mead. It's now at the lowest level that it's been since it filled in the 1930s. In 2000, Lake Mead was at about 95%, which was about 15 feet below that walkway right now. Just 20 so years ago? 2000. Wow, that's kind of impossible to picture right now, standing here. It's dramatic. <laughs> Do you expect it'll get back to that point? We need at least four or more years of consecutive good runoff into the upper basin, good snowpack, mm -hmm. um, for the reservoirs to be able to rebound completely. Can you talk me through what these structures are? These are intake towers. Water goes in, spins a turbine, which spins a generator and creates hydropower, which goes out to all of these power lines that you see. That's how Las Vegas is lit up at night. Las Vegas is lit up at night, and uh, Arizona and California also receive power from Hoover Dam. I'm waiting to feel my ears pop. We produce our own power. These are little generators. There's one on the Nevada side too, and this is the power for the dam itself. For the dam itself. The way it works, as the reservoir level is high, there's more pressure pushing the water in to right. the pipes, to the turbines. As it lowers, there's less pressure. Is there a lower limit to how little water there can be in here for them to still work? Elevation 950 is the lowest that we'd be able to go and still produce hydropower. The water level at Lake Mead is currently around 1,067 feet. So if the water level gets below 950, this dam will no longer really function as a generator of power. Th that is true, but we don't anticipate that happening. Right. Is it a little despairing for you to come out and see? It's concerning. I mean, all of us are concerned, but I also have a lot of faith in the people that are working on the problem. 